This presentation is a part of Audio Adventure Theater. CTD Productions presents to you An Unconventional Confidence, a short story written by Lucy Maud Montgomery, starring Renee Thiessen as the girl, Caleb Thiessen as the young man, Sharon Galar as Beatrix, and Aaron Thiessen as the narrator. The girl in black and yellow ran frantically down the gray road under the pines. There was nobody to see her, but she would have run if all Halifax had been looking on. For had she not on the loveliest new hat, a creation in yellow chiffon with big black shoe, and a dress to match? And was there not a shower coming straight from the hills across the harbor? Down at the end of the long, resinous avenue, the girl saw the shore road, with the pavilion shutting out the view of the harbor's mouth. Oh, I shall be too late! If she could only reach the pavilion in time! It was a neck-and-neck -neck race between the rain and the girl, but the girl won. Just as she flew out upon the shore road, a tall young man came pelting down the ladder, and they both dashed up the steps of the pavilion together as the rain swooped down upon them. <sighs> oh. Oh. Oh, boy. Uh, I'm so glad I didn't get my hat wet. It would have been a pity. This is a very pretty hat. Pretty? Anyone can have a pretty hat. Our cook has one. This is a creation. I'm sorry. I ought to have known. But I am very stupid. Well, I suppose a mere man couldn't be expected to understand exactly. You cannot be a Haligonian. I am sure I have not seen you before. No, <laughs> I have only just arrived. Oh, I see. Please sit down. I'm tired. Oh, of course. Goodness knows how long this rain will last, but I shall stay here until it clears up. If it rains for a week, I will not have my new hat spoiled. I suppose I shouldn't have put it on. Beatrix said it was going to rain. Beatrix is such a horribly good prophet. I detest people who are good prophets, don't you? I think that they are responsible for all the evils that they did. But that is just what I told Beatrix, and I was determined to put on this hat and come out to the park today. I simply had to be alone. If I knew I'd be alone out here, everybody else would be at the football game. By the way, why aren't you there? I wasn't even aware that there was a football game on hand. Dear me, where can you have been not to have heard of it? It's between the Dalhousie team and the Wanderers. Almost everybody here is on the Wanderers' side because they are Haligonians, but I am not. I like the college boy best. Beatrix says that is just because of my innate contrariness. Last year, I simply screamed myself hoarse with enthusiasm. The Dalhousie team won the trophy. If you are so interested in the game, it is a wonder you didn't go to see it yourself. Well, I just couldn't. If anybody had ever told me that there would be a football game in Halifax, and that I would elect to prowl about by myself in the park instead of going to it, I'd have laughed them to scorn. Even Beatrix would never have dared to prophesy that. But you see, it has happened. I was too crumpled up in my mind to care about football today. I had to come here and have it out with myself. That is why I put on my hat. I thought perhaps I might get through my mental gymnastics in time to go to the game afterwards. But I didn't. It's just maddening, too. I got this hat and dress on purpose to wear to it. They're black and yellow, you see. The Dalhousie colors. It was my own idea. I was sure it would make a sensation. But I couldn't go to the game and take any interest in it, feeling as I do. Could I now? Of course you couldn't. It would be utterly out of the question. I like to have my opinion bolstered up. Do you know, I want to tell you something. May I? Well, you may. I'll never tell anyone as long as I live. I don't know you, and you don't know me. That is why I want to tell you about it. I must tell somebody. And if I told anybody I knew, they'd tell it all over Halifax. It is dreadful to be talking to you like this. Beatrix would have three fits, one after the other, if she saw me. But Beatrix is a slave to conventionality. I glory in discarding it at times. You don't mind, do you? Not at all. I've reached the point where I must have a confidence. 
or go crazy. Once I could tell things to Beatrix. That was before she got engaged. Now she tells everything to him. There is no earthly way of preventing her. I've tried them all. So nowadays, when I get into trouble, I tell it out loud to myself in the glass. It's a relief, you know. But that is no good now. I want to tell it to somebody who can say things back. Will you promise to say things back? Yes, I promise. Very well. But please don't look at me while I'm telling you. I'll be sure to blush in cases. When Beatrix wants to be particularly aggravating, she says I've lost the art of blushing. But that is only her way of putting it, you know. Sometimes I blush dreadfully. Well, the root of the whole trouble is simply this. There is a young man in England. I always think of him as the creature. He is the son of a man who was father's especial crony in boyhood, before father immigrated to Canada. Worse than that, he comes of a family which has contracted a vile habit of marrying into our family. It's come down through the ages so long that it's become chronic. Father left most of his musty traditions in England, but he brought this pet one with him. He and this friend agreed that the latter's son should marry one of father's daughters. It ought to have been Beatrix. She is the oldest. But Beatrix has a pug nose, so father settled on me. From my earliest recollection, I have been given to understand that just as soon as I grew up, there would be a ready-made husband imported from England for me. I was doomed to it from my cradle. Now, I ask you, could anything be more hopelessly, appallingly stupid and devoid of romance as that? It's pretty bad. You see, the shadow of it has been over me my whole life. Of course, when I was a very little girl, I didn't mind it so much. It was such a long way off, and lots of things might happen. The creature might run off with some other girl, or I might have the smallpox. Or Beatrix's nose might be straight when she grew up. And if Beatrix's nose was straight, she'd be a great deal prettier than I am. But nothing did happen, and her nose is pudgier than ever. Then when I grew up, things were horrid. I could never have a single little bit of fun. And Beatrix had such a good time, she had scores of lovers in spite of her nose. To be sure, she's engaged now. And he's a horrid, fatty little creature. But he's her own choice. She wasn't told that there was a man in England who she must marry by and by, when he got sufficiently reconciled to the idea to come and ask her. Oh, it makes me furious. Is... is there... anyone else? Oh dear, no. How could there be? And I was as good as engaged to the creature. That is one of my grievances. Just think how much fun I've missed. I used to rage to Beatrix about it. She would tell me that I ought to be thankful to have the chance of making such a good match. The creature is rich, you know, and clever. As if I cared how clever or rich he is. Beatrix made me so cross that I gave up saying anything and sulked by myself. So they think I'm quite reconciled to it, but I'm not. He might be very nice after all. Nice? That isn't the point. Oh, don't you see? But no, you're a man. You can't understand. You must just take my word for it. The whole thing makes me furious. But I haven't told you the worst. The creature is on his way out to Canada now. He may arrive here at any minute. And they are all so aggravatingly delighted over it. <laughs> what do you suppose he feels like? Well, I've been too taken up with my own feelings to worry about his. But I dare say they are pretty much like mine. He must loathe and detest the very thought of me. Oh, I don't think he does. Don't you? Well, what do you suppose he does think of it all? You ought to understand the man's part of it better than I can. Uh, there's as much difference in men as in women. I, I may be right or wrong, you see, but I imagine he would feel something like this. From boyhood, he has understood that away out in Canada, there is a little girl growing up who is someday to be his wife. She becomes his boyish ideal of all that is good and true. He pictures her as beautiful and winsome and sweet. She is his heart's lady, and the thought of her abides with him as a safeguard and an inspiration. For her sake, he resolves to make the most of himself and live a clean, loyal life. When she comes to him, she must find his heart fit to receive her. There is never a time in all his life when the dream of her does not gleam before him as of a star to which he may aspire with all reverence and love. You are splendid. If he thought so. But no, I'm sure he doesn't. 
He's just coming out here like a martyr going to the stake. He knows he will be expected to propose to me when he gets here, and he knows that I know it too, and he knows I know that I will be expected to say my very prettiest yes. But are you going to say it? No. That is my secret. I'm going to say a most emphatic no. I say, but won't your family make an awful row? Of course. But I rather enjoy a row now and then. It stirs up one's grey matter so nicely. I came out here this afternoon and thought the whole affair over from beginning to end. And I'm determined to say no. Oh, I, I wouldn't make it so irreconcilable as that. Uh, I'd leave a loophole of escape. Uh, you see, if you were to like him a little better than you expect, it would be awkward to have committed yourself by a rash vow to saying no, wouldn't it? I suppose it would. But then, you know, I won't change my mind. It, it's just as well to be on the safe side. <sighs> my, the rain has finally stopped. <sighs> Perhaps you're right. So I'll just resolve that I will say no if I don't want to say yes. But that really amounts to the same thing, you know. Thank you so much for letting me tell you all about it. It must have bored you terribly, but it has done me so much good. I feel quite calm and rational now. I can go home and behave myself. Goodbye. Goodbye. <sighs> Soon after the girl arrived home, she was sought out in her room by Beatrix returning from the football game with some very important news. Oh, there you are. I thought you might be moseying about up in your room. Well, you'll certainly wish you had gone to the game now. The Dalhousie team won. Eight to four. Oh, what a shame I wasn't there. They'd have gone mad over my dress. But I have bigger news than that. Guess who called this afternoon? Oh, I don't know. Who? Him. Oh. Your future husband. He's just arrived from England, and he'll be here for dinner within the hour. So you'd better pretty yourself up. You know, first impressions are extremely important. How fortunate I relieved my mind to that young man out in the park today. If I had come back with all that pent-up feeling seething within me, and heard this news right on top of it all, I might have flown into a thousand pieces. What lovely brown eyes he had. I do dote on brown eyes. The creature will be sure to have fishy blue ones. When the girl went down to meet the creature, she found herself confronted by the young man from the pavilion. For the first, last, and only time in her life, the girl had not a word to say. But her family thought her confusion very natural and pretty. They really had not expected her to behave so well. As for the young man, his manner was flawless. Toward the end of the dinner, when the girl was beginning to recover herself, the young man turned to her. You know I promise never to tell. Be sure you don't, then. But aren't you glad you left the loophole? Oh, perhaps. An Unconventional Confidence, written by Lucy Maud Montgomery, was adapted for audio by Renee Thiessen, directed by Renee Thiessen, produced by Renee Thiessen, starring Renee Thiessen, and... And Renee Thiessen hopes you enjoyed it immensely. <clears throat> and I am Renee... Uh, Ren Reed Thiessen. This was a CTD production. Be sure to check out our website at audioadventuretheater.blogspot.com.